and welcome to another teacher talks teacher talks 80 yes we are going to have our 80 session <coughs> tonight we are getting close to 100 it's really great number <laughs> uh, for me and for us also and for you too and tonight we are going to have another part of the world tonight we are going to go dubai yes our guest is going to be from dubai and he is uh, a very good educator and very good teacher trainer uh, and also he's uh, actually teacher trainer mena for macmillan education <coughs> macmillan education and uh, nathan waller yes he is going to be with us tonight and when he comes we are going to our live session with him i'm sure that we are going to have a very a very a fruitful session with him tonight let me invite him then we can start our lovely conversation with nathan Yes, there he is, Nathan. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you I perfectly. Can. can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, I can. I can, Nathan. It's great. And before we starting our live session, I would like to say thank you, Nathan, to accept my invitation to Teacher Talks 80 session. And it's really uh, great and it's really an honor to have you in Teacher Talks session, Nathan. Oh, it's it's uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's nice. This is uh, the 80th. So congratulations for getting to uh, such a, an amazing you. number of podcasts. <laughs> Actually, 80, 80 is nice for me because uh, I was born in 1980. So wow, 80 and 80. So there you go. <laughs> it's great. It's great is a good number. that there is <laughs> there is a connection between my my session number and your <laughs> the age yeah. born age. It's really nice born date. Sorry. All right then. So we are all busy as usual. So if you are ready and we can start, ready for action. <laughs> Nervous, but let's go. Let's do it. All right then. It's wonderful. I know about you, Nathan, but maybe our uh, guests and our audiences would like to know about you. So can you tell us about yourself, please, and a bit about your experiences, too? Uh, sure. I mean, I think you've already introduced me. So uh, my name is Nathan, obviously, and I am the teacher trainer for the MENA region, which is the Middle East and North Africa region uh, for Macmillan Education. So I handle um, all the professional development. They call me teacher trainer, but actually I think it's more of a professional development role uh, because mm -hmm. it's in service teachers. Um, so supporting um, both people who are teaching using Macmillan course books or materials or resources, and also supporting other teachers as well uh, with all sorts of um, continuous professional development opportunities, webinars, uh, short courses, um, observations, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So that's oh, what I, I do. Uh, Experiences-wise, oof, I think you're going to need longer than an hour. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a long story and it takes in um, a lot of weird and wonderful places around the world. Um, I've worked, lived, worked and studied in 12 countries, I think. Um, I think I've been to more than 60. So yeah, lots wow. of different things, different places. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a long journey. Weirdly, I come from a very um, humble area of the world. I come from um, a very rural part of the UK, a place called Cornwall, uh, which is mm -hmm. in the southwest, right at the bottom of the UK. And I would say Cornwall definitely influences my personality. It influences my interests. Like I said, it's very rural, but it's also, you know, uh, a kind of outdoor culture, a very active culture. You have a lot of things like surfing and outdoor sports, uh, which I did a lot of when I was younger. But it's also a very laid back part of the world. People there are very relaxed, not too stressed. Uh, and I, I think I've carried that, um, that personality trait. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm from. Um, I think in terms of my career path or my academic path, it's slightly more unusual than, uh, than, than most people. Um, I, 
I, I wasn't a very good student at school. I was one of these kids that was, you know, fairly smart. I could kind of get through school. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't a high flyer at all. And I wasn't really interested in, in formal learning. I was one of those kids that would rather be outside, you know, mm -hmm. rather playing sport, hanging out with my friends. So I didn't really do that well at school. Uh, I didn't, also didn't really do very well at college. Um, and I had some family issues at the time. So I didn't go to university. I was one of these people that went to work. Um, so I left school at, you know, 16, 17, and, and I went and worked. And I did lots of different kinds of jobs, which I think, I think that was good for me. I think it was uh, part of growing up. Um, it was good to get a range of experiences uh, and think about things from different points of view. I worked in finance. I worked in retail. I, I did all sorts of stuff. I was self-employed at one point. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I kind of was doing lots of different things. And then I kind of came back to education. So I came back as a mature student when I was 26. Um, and I did my bachelor's then. I see. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was a bit of a, an, an unorthodox path, I guess, but, but a nice one. Um, and it was nice to go back into education as a mature student, doing something that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so I started development um, for my bachelor's. Um, and, I, and I was offered actually a, um, a PGC, not PGC, I'm sorry, a BA in education, a B ed. I was offered that course and I was offered a child development course. And I chose the child okay. development course because I was more interested in, you know, how children uh, develop and learn and grow. So rather mm -hmm. than just kind of, you know, I'm going to be a you know, standard teacher learning how to fill in forms and prepare for the assessments and all this kind of stuff. I was more interested in the childhood angle, I think. Um, I so so mm -hmm. I did. And I did my CELTA. I left the UK. Um, this is a long time ago now. Um, so, I, so I went to Prague on a five pounds one way ticket flight. Um, I used the last of my savings to pay for my shelter and a month of accommodation and probably a, a hundred pivos to keep me going throughout the course. Uh, you know what pivo is, right? I'm sure you do. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and that was it. I, I ran out of money and I had to, you know, find jobs wherever I could. So. Yeah, I traveled the world teaching, um, doing assessment, doing teach training, um, lots of different types of things. So, yes, it was uh, some Very interesting, interesting. times. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I told you. Is that all? <laughs> well, there's <laughs> really... lots of things I can tell you. <laughs> it's really great. It's a really long Indeed. journey to do it with the different parts of the world you've been. It's really, really great. Yeah. All right. Would you like to add anything else? Or... Should I move? Uh, I will probably think of things as we go. So okay, I will then, okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Nathan. So, according to your, and when you think about your own education, uh, the, when you think about the things that you tell us, what was or were your turning point or points in your own education? In my education, I, th I think there are probably two. One was realizing that I wanted to go back into education as a mature student, the one I just mentioned. Um, and I think that that probably wouldn't have happened if I didn't have um, support from uh, a few particular people. So, you know, I, I was working, I was, I was living in Manchester at the time. Um, and I, and I kind of knew, I, I kind of knew I wanted to do like child psychology or something like this. Mm -hmm. but, you know, going back to university is, is expensive. <laughs> it's not that easy. And it's like, where do you start? Like, how do I gain experience to help me start on that path, on that journey? And it was actually uh, my, my housemate at the time. It was his uh, sister-in-law. She was a primary teacher um, mm -hmm. in a town called Bond, which is just outside of Manchester. And she put me in touch with someone that she studied with, um, a lady called Naomi. And she was a reception class teacher in Manchester. You know, and, and I met up with her one day and I told her what I was interested in. I was like, you know, I want to get started. You know, and, and she gave me a lot of advice and she let me uh, volunteer in her classroom. So for about a year and a half, I was volunteering in the school, which was great. I was just a, like a teaching assistant, uh, helping out. I did nursery, I did, I did reception. And I learned a lot that way, you know, just kind of being on the sidelines, like, and, and mm -hmm. spending a lot of time with kids, you know, learning about play-based learning, all of these kinds of things. And from that, you know, I managed to use that volunteering to apply to go back to university. Um, and then I got on that on my BA course. So that was definitely a turning point, you know, the, the volunteering part, you know, getting involved, finding out uh -huh. what it is that you're interested in and, and, and sticking with that. That's one, I think. 
The other one I would say is when I did my masters. So I went back to the UK again a few years ago, and um, I did my masters in anthropology, which again is a, a fascinating subject,、um, oh, and again not really related to education.、Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was working、um, on a teacher training project in. Uh, Malaysian Borneo, so I was on the island of Borneo, which was、mm-hmm. fantastic. I was living in kind of the middle of nowhere,、uh, working with very remote schools in in Malaysia. So you know th- these were you know small, very small schools, very rural. They had no power. Some of them, some of them were on the little islands. So I would have to take like a little boat for like an hour out in almost to the Philippines, and you go to. Have you ever seen?、Um, There's a BBC documentary about、um, uh, some people who never live on land; they only live on the water permanently. So they live.、Um, really. They live on. They live. Yeah, they live boats and they live on kind of stilted houses, but they live permanently on the water. And some of them were those types of communities. You know, I would go to a,、uh, an island, and there would be like six families.、Mm-hmm. So I really got into the the cultural side.、Um, Of, of childhood, so I wanted to do anthropology of childhood and study children's culture. So I went back to do anthropology in childhood, anthropology of childhood、um, for my masters,、uh, and that came about from that experience. So that was a, a big turning point, I guess, kind of focusing down on on the area of education that I was most interested in. So there's,、okay. there's two. two I, oh, I see. It's very interesting turning points that you have. But I'll check that the the people who live in the permanently in the water and the land. Yeah, I will check that. My, in, you said in in my, Malaysia. I, in,、uh-huh. It's in Malaysia. Yeah, there there is between the Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines.、Uh, it's gone.、Uh, my mind's gone blank. You know when you you it's there on the tip of your tongue, but you can't get it out.、Uh-oh, Hopefully、right、by、on. the end of of that particular.、Uh, <laughs> I will. I will、cultural. check them. I see. Thank、yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan. All right. So, Nathan, when you think about all these experiences and、uh, in education, so probably you have a kind of a th- philosophy of teaching. So, what is it? What is your philosophy of teaching? My philosophy of teaching. I don't think I have I just one <laughs> philosophy. I, it's it's a tough and tough one to be honest. I think.、Uh, I would say I don't know. I'm thinking that for for younger students, whenever I've taught uh, uh, pre-primary or primary students, I would say that I'm definitely a, a, a play-based learning、uh, that kind of philosophy, and I, I really like、um, story-based learning as well, using stories as much as possible. And I think within ELT, that's both of those、um, both of those approaches. I think are very kind of underutilized. Um, the ELT can be a bit can be quite formal. I think when we're teaching ELT, we've got that focus of I want them to learn the vocabulary and I want them to, to do the grammar and I want to practice their skills. And, and stories are quite time consuming. They can be quite difficult to kind of fit that stuff in and, and, and track how students are perf- performing and progressing. So I think people tend to leave stories out a lot, which is I, I love stories. I love getting you know the students you know interacting and and and. Engaging with the story, I think there's a lot in there. You know, the language is meaningful, it's contextual. You know, it, it gives them a lot of exposure. You know, it gets them thinking about、um, different things. You know, different ideas, different ways of being. So, I, I really, I like story-based learning is one of my favorite. I think, but play-based learning as well. I did a lot of play-based learning stuff in the UK when I when I lived there. So,、mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think general philosophy. I think I'm a, a very humanistic type of of teacher. Get to know your、mm-hmm. students. This, this、yeah. type of thing. Be interested in your、Thank、students. You.、Mm-hmm. Definitely, it's, it's not nice. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for、uh, talking about your philosophy. All right. So again, it's,、uh, it's something about your experiences. When you think about again your experiences in education, especially English language teaching, how do you see the place of ELT or English language teaching in the future? What is your idea about it? ELT in the future, it's it's tough to know. I think. I mean, COVID's definitely changed the ELT landscape a lot recently,、um, mm-hmm. and I guess it will do that. I think it's hard to see what the long term impact of COVID's going to be on ELT, and and in teaching in general, probably. I think, I think there's a desire already for people to kind of slip back into old habits,、um, and that, and that's a shame. I think. I think people have started、uh-huh. down this path. It'll be a shame if people didn't. You know, 
stick with that and keep going with the <laughs> with that they're already doing. Um, I think in the future, I think students are becoming more demanding um, and I think students are better informed now, um, both about uh, good quality learning experiences and a, a change within that. And I think, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think it's good that they're more demanding. Um, I think that's good for teachers. It pushes them. Um, I don't think of anything else but in, the, in the future. I think, I think one of the things that we're starting to see is that um, it's because of those demands, both from students and probably from parents as well, is that mm -hmm. state is being asked to kind of step up, I think. That people are saying, you know, what, as, as our children should be learning better English. And of course, I'm talking out in an ESL context, I see. you know, outside, outside mm -hmm. of native speaking contexts. I think that, yeah, that people are saying, you know, that it, when they go to school, they should learn a, a, a certain level of English. And people know what the benefits of that are. I think in the past, it was quite difficult for students to know what the benefits of English were if they didn't live somewhere where English was easily accessible. You know, if you're in Dubai, you can see English in the, in the landscape. So you can say, okay, well, I could learn English to access that. You know, but if you're in somewhere where English isn't widely used, certainly outside of cities, um, then, you know, they're like, well, why would I bother learning English? You know, I remember when I first, my first job was in Oman, you know, the kids there, they, they had no reason to learn English whatsoever. So there's not that motivational aspect. And I think that's changed a lot. Um, I think students are starting to see, actually, I can play video games online and, and interact with people in English. I can access I things on the internet. I think that changes the landscape a lot. I think that that helps shift. I think the mm -hmm. private sector will need to step up to that as well. And I think that they will probably try to stay one step ahead of that by creating better digital resources um, and probably tapping into that kind of uh, self-learning uh, area. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see publishers moving towards a, a subscription model, you know, a kind of Netflix model, mm -hmm. where instead of one course book and following that course, you know, that somebody else has decided that you should study, like a teacher, they will start saying, yes. you have access to all of our content, but you pay a monthly subscription. I, I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if that came in. And a lot more, I see. you know, gamified learning, students accessing English language learning content mm -hmm. by themselves. I'm working through it um, in, the, in their own way. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see things like that, you know, tapping into, into different interests that students have. I, I think that that's quite likely, but I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you said, who knows? Actually, we can't guess. We're just talking about our guests about it and we cannot know yeah. what's going to happen. But thank you very much yeah. for these really nice uh, ideas about it. Yeah, I'll come back and watch rewatch this on YouTube in three years time and be like, look, see, I was right on the money. <laughs> yeah, why not? You're right. All right, then. Yeah. So let me ask you another question about thank you very much, by the way. So you yeah. know that uh, before the pandemic, we have all most of the teacher training courses on face to face. But after pandemic started, this teacher, especially uh, teacher training courses, move to online platform, most of them. What do you think about it? When you compare about it, are they as beneficial as face-to-face -face or what is your idea about it? I th yeah, I mean, personally, I think that they're, they're an essential part of, um, of teachers' CPD now. Mm -hmm. I think all, all teachers are either doing it or uh, engaging with it in some kind of way. I think that it's, um, it's easier for teachers to connect in that kind of you know, online teacher training course. It's, it's a tough mm -hmm. one. I know that people do things face to face. The only problem with face to face for me is that it's very hard as the trainer to know, you know, whether or not what you're doing with a teacher or a group of teachers translates to, to practice, to what, you know, to a benefit for the student. So, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, we've been doing here in MENA is trying to change, you know, and COVID's helped us change as well. But it's, it's, it's kind of stepping back, you know, taking our time and reflecting and saying, you know, the way we've always done things in publishing with teacher training, is that the best way? You know, can we do this better? You know, and a part of that is starting from this idea of everything that we do should benefit the student. So everything we're doing with teachers should have a knock-on effect to what students do in, in the classroom and outside of the <clears> classroom. 
and it's it's very hard with with face to face because sometimes it can be or I can feel certainly from the trainer's perspective and if you're flying around you know you fly into a country you do a training course and then you leave it's hard to follow that up it's hard to know whether or not they're you know they're kind of smiling and and telling you what you want to hear and then going back to the classroom oh we'll just we'll just do it like we've always done it it's it's hard to know yeah. But with online, you know, you can kind of follow people through, you can give them feedback, they can touch base with you, you know, even when you're not there. Relationships, it's just a different type of relationship. But I, I think I do think the online teacher training courses, I think they're essential. You know, there's so many ways to access them. You've got short courses, you know, I run ones that are like three or four hours, you know, where you do something and then you get feedback about it. You know, but then you could do something bigger, like a Nile course, um, you know, a paid yeah. for course, <clears throat> one over four weeks or mm -hmm. six you know, so I think the teachers can, can can do online courses in their own time it's hard for te you know teachers to do continuous professional development so you know having that flexibility you know they can do it when it suits them they can pick a topic that they like again face to face can be very you know I'm the trainer I've decided what we're going to do today let's do it you go away whereas I think online is it can be a lot more flexible um, and teachers I can see. decide what they mm -hmm. want I think so I understand. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan, uh, about this uh, com com comparison between that. All right. I would like to talk about another really important and really, I really, really like that the program that Macmillan have. And uh, mm. I checked about it, it's, which, is, which is education or sustainable development, which is really, really important topic, especially in yeah. this period. And citizenship program. Can you of Macmillan Education. Can you tell us about a little bit? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is our, our newest program. Um, it's, it's a new initiative that Macmillan have just started. So we've got a lot of things that are going to be going on. They just started recently in the last couple of months. Um, and they'll be running all the way through next year uh, and beyond as well. But yeah, I think it's, it's an initiative to kind of address this, this question of you know, what is the responsibility of, of language teachers to, to challenge students, to challenge content? Mm -hmm. What is happening in, and I guess to our world um, overall? You know, where do our students mm -hmm. kind of fit in? So the, um, it's a really long title, isn't it? Education for Sustainable Development and Citizenship, ESDC. We're calling it that for short, because it makes it easier. But yeah, it's, it's broken into kind of three areas. So, you know, it's about, uh, reflecting upon our content um, to make sure that they're kind of aligned with kind of global standards. So one area is the the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, you know, making sure yeah. that we're really focused on goal four. Um, that's one area. The second one is diversity and inclusion. So D and I. Sorry, diversity, equity and inclusion is the title. So that's the second strand. Um, you know, and that's making sure things like... Um, you know, students are represented you know, within content, mm -hmm. you know, DLT materials. You know, if you pick up a reader from or an ELT course book from 10 years ago, you know, who are the people? What background are they from? You know, what kind of messages are being sent indirectly through the content? So it's about oh, challenging see. that, making sure that students feel represented by the content that they're studying from, because they're more likely to engage if they feel connected mm -hmm. with the content itself. And then the third part is global citizenship education, GCE, which again, it's been around for a little while, but making sure yes. that we're addressing uh, global values, making sure that we are you know, asking uh, some of those difficult questions to students and getting them to reflect on you know, their impact on the world, um, their impact on the, uh, the environment, their impact socially, culturally, um, and getting them to see that everything's kind of interconnected, I guess, that they're part of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. that uh, you know what they do impacts other people even if they don't see it I think um, I see I see so they're the three strands and then within those three strands you've got three more strands um, and that's kind of about knowledge skills and attitudes so again traditionally we would focus mostly on knowledge um, within education but people uh -huh. are starting to say we need to we need to push that to skills and also changing attitudes uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a positive way so and, and also embedding those things into the whole learning journey so again you know we traditionally wouldn't perhaps push more difficult topics 
until students are teenagers. But actually, people are saying, you know, to be scaffolded right from when you're in kindergarten. You know, there's things, values that you can embed into teaching and learning to, to, mm -hmm. to support when they become teenagers so that you don't ask them a difficult question when they're a teenager. And say, we've never done anything like this before. Actually, you're kind of preparing them all the way so, you know, and, and getting them to do things, you know, to go home, to go into their community, ask questions and, and be an active member um, and do, and do stuff mm -hmm. like that. So let's, for an example, let's just say it's something to do like um, challenging uh, rubbish. Yeah, every, everywhere in the, the world mm -hmm. has a rubbish problem. You know, yeah, so in, in, in pre-primary, you know, it's like, how do we look after the classroom environment? In primary, then we start to extend that. So like, okay, well, what do you do at home? You know, how can you change habits at home? And then when they get to teens, you can then say, okay, we've been doing this small and we've got it a bit bigger. Now as a teenager, how can you actively do things within your community we to know. make mm -hmm. possible? So it, it's, it's about embedding them um, step by step um, and supporting the I students see. through that and modeling to them as well. You know, schools also have to... Um, to change their, their habits, change their cultures, you know, analyze what they're doing. So part of it's about that as well, I think. Come on. I see, <laughs> my God, it's, it's very interesting. It's really, it's really, really nice program. By the way, I just want to ask another question. For example, if, if a, a school would like, uh, would like to apply this program or to do it to school, what should they do about it? Should yes, they apply so... somewhere to get the program? It's, so it's, uh... The program is kind of, it's holistic. So part of it is about changing uh, the landscape within Macmillan. So you don't need to really do anything. It'll start just being embedded into the resources that we make. So when you get oh, the resources, you'll, yeah, there'll be like little symbols saying, you know, this is focusing on environmental issues. Oh, this is focused I got it. Whatever. Yeah, that's part of it. But there's also a whole bunch of other supportive resources, which are all free. Um, and if you go to the Macmillan English website, um, or One Stop English, because a lot of it's held on there. So those are the two places, macmillanenglish.com or onestopenglish.com. Um, I've been um, education for sustainable development and citizenship. Um, those two should pop up on Google, so you go straight there. But there, there's loads of, there's lots of free worksheets that students can do. There's lots of teacher uh -huh. materials there on the website. You can just download them. There's some blogs to help people kind of get interested in the topic. Nice blogs on there. Um, yeah, and just... Yeah, connect with us because we're doing loads of different types of activities over this I over see. this next year. All right, I, I can understand. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan. <clears throat> All right, so let's let's move to another question. I know they. And by the way, how long have you been living in Dubai? I've been here for ooh, six years almost. I think. Oh, all right, great. Yeah. Six years is enough to have an answer about my next question. So when you okay. think about all the, the, the life that you live in over there, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of working in Dubai as an English teacher and trainer? Mm, okay. Um, and there's, lot, there's lots of advantages. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good city. It's a cool city to live in. Uh, it's a very international city, so you can kind of get anything you want here. Uh, the weather's great. The, the beach is great. Uh, the dog parks are great. Um, Work-wise, I mean, I've never been an English teacher in Dubai itself. I've only ever worked here with the, with publishers, um, so I only kind of know the publishing side. Although I I've been to lots of schools and universities, but I've never actually formally taught here. But I know that there's a lot of opportunity. So that's that's definitely a positive. Um, trying to think, it's very central. I mean, like I said, I cover all of Mina, so. As a transport hub, Dubai is a, a fabulous uh, transport hub. It's very easy to get anywhere from here. Disadvantages, I don't know. I can't really think of any, to be honest. It's expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's very, I'm sure that it's really expensive. Yeah, and it's very competitive as well. Um, the UAE is very, a very wow. competitive market. I think if, if you're a teacher and you wanted to move here, I, you know, there's a lot of places if you had your cell to you could probably move. It's a bit more difficult here. It's a lot more kind of high level international schools. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a very competitive market to try and work in. Um, very business driven. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a pretty nice place to live.
<laughs> yeah. Okay then. Thank you for these answer and suggestions about Dubai. <laughs> I never been there, but maybe in the future if I have a chance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I never. I never okay. been to Dubai. Maybe in the future. You're in, who knows? You're in, no, I mean. Are you in uh, Istanbul? Yeah. No, I'm not in Istanbul. I'm in Izmir. Actually, I'm in Manisa. And Manisa is You're very in close to Izmir. Yeah. I've been. To, I'm not living in Izmir. Izmir. It's just. Uh, really? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Izmir is a really nice city. Yes. No. I, I, yeah. Izmir is nice. I remember the. Uh, I remember a really crazy big bus station in in Izmir. Um, <laughs> and I was. I came actually because I was really interested in uh, Roman history at the time, and I wanted to go to uh, Ephesus, which is yeah, down on the coast, right? Marvelous. Uh, right. Yes, beautiful mm -hmm. place. Yes. I've traveled there. So yeah, I've, I've been there. I've been to, to, to Turkey lots of times, actually. Uh, it's a really nice country. I love it there. Right. <laughs> Thank you. You are always welcome. <laughs> yes, I'll let you know. All right. Okay. So let's move to another question. And uh, my yeah. next question is about uh, the digital resources and the tools for their the, the, the teacher's classroom. So what can you suggest to the teachers or educators to choose digital resources and tools for their classroom? Uh, okay, so digital Hard resources. Question. Yeah, so in terms of like how to, to choose them, well, I don't know, this is a tough question. I just, I, I don't know. I would say, I would say experiment a lot, try mm -hmm. different things out. And I think when, I think one of the nice things for teachers or I would recommend to teachers is to, is to talk to your students about the fact that you are, you're experimenting. So just say like, mm -hmm. we're gonna try this today. You know, it, it might be a disaster or it, it might work. And if it works, that's great. And if it doesn't, well, we'll know for next time and we'll try something different. I think students will actually be quite, are probably more understanding than we give them credit for. And uh, I think they can be quite sympathetic. I think sometimes we feel like we need to pretend like we're the expert in everything, in every subject. And um, I see. especially with content, you know, they, we, they expect us to be content experts in everything, which, I, which, which we obviously cannot be. So... I think it's good to be kind of real with, with students and tell them, you know, actually, I've never used this online tool, but I thought it would be kind of cool to, to have a go with it. You know, I've never, I've never used Flipgrid, but, you know, let's try making some post-it notes and see how that goes. And, <laughs> and I, think that you'll, I think you'll find that then they'll, they'll make suggestions as well. They'll start to feel confident and they'll say, well, actually, I know a really cool website, which might have helped you to do this. And, you know, then you can use that with another class. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah letting go of that control a little bit when it comes to digital. I, I think one of the main things about digital is not, is seeing that digital won't solve all of your problems. It's just another tool. You need to use whatever you're using digitally, you need to use it strategically, I think. It either should make your life easier or your students' life mm -hmm. easier, or it should make your lessons you know, more engaging um, and interactive. I think if you're just trying to replicate what you did before, but in a digital way it's not that necessary I, I don't think yes of course you're teaching online and then you of course you have to but i think as things go back to normal and, and teachers go face to face i, I think they don't need to feel digitally i think it's it's using it to its advantage where it's appropriate um, and for that I see. I... make it interactive get students engaging with with the content in, in a digital way mm -hmm. and, and also giving you can you can differentiate as well you know, give, using digital not always for input, but for them to produce as well. So, you know, you can say you can either produce this non-digitally, you can either write something or draw something or create something, or you can do the project online. You can do it in a digital and present it, you know, digitally if mm -hmm. you want to. Give them more options, I think, to, to be able uh -huh. to to produce as well. I think that's a key part of, the, of using digital. I see. Yeah, I, I think. It. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much. And probably when you have a kind of a teacher, I mean, like training courses or webinars, probably you always, you know, to talk about your good teaching experiences or good samples. But this time I wanted to ask you vice versa. Can you tell us one of your bad teaching experiences in your career? <laughs> one of my bad teaching experiences. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do, do people normally have lots of bad teaching experiences? I hope not. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. 
know if I recall any. I mean, I've had some very challenging experiences. I'll tell you that. But uh, sure. whether I would call them, I call them bad. I don't know. I mean, I consider myself an experiential learner. So I guess in some way, even if they're challenging experiences, they still kind of shaped how I think and and how I approach teaching and learning and how I approach conversations about it with teachers. So I guess that's a, that's in itself a positive. Mm-hmm. But I definitely, I mean, I said I went to Oman um, for one of my first teaching contracts and that was a very challenging experience. You know, I, I kind of turned up, I didn't really know what to expect. I was driven almost two hours outside the capital, outside of my, to, uh, to a very small village. And I was teaching a very small school. I taught all grades, grades one to six. So I was teaching all, all six year groups. And there was one class for each. They were 99% boys. And there was no other English language speakers at the school. So there was wow. like five other, five other ladies who were there. And none of them spoke English. Um, none of the kids really spoke any English. So I was kind of just dropped off and told like, <laughs> off you go. And I was like, you don't have, you have no resources. They've got no books. They've got no library. Like there's like, how, where do I start? So, and, and of oh. course you take, you know, whatever it was, let's say 150 boys with who are used to, to interacting with five Arabic speaking ladies. They, you know, they, the boys definitely were in control of that school. The ladies were not in control of anything. You know, they were they were fighting in the in the in the lunch break. I saw them completely destroy a lunch room once. It was it was a hard job. So I stuck that out for a year. Like, yeah, keep keep your head down. Get on. With it. That was challenging. Maybe someone will call I that see. bad. It's definitely a challenge. I see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the I, nice. Mm-hmm. Nice Definitely. experience that you mentioned. Yeah, have one. <laughs> Only one year you worked there. Yes, and then I then I moved. I moved to Egypt from there. Uh, and I had a much right. had a experience after that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Nathan. All right, now let's move more challenging questions. <laughs> oh. Here is the question: Can you tell us five adjectives that describe an effective language teacher? Five adjectives that describe an effective language teacher. Um, okay, uh, ooh, I think of some. I think that um, I think effective teachers are reflective. I think that's an okay. a, a, One. You know, developing. I think that they need to be creative. I think teachers, good Two. teachers, are very. They, they, you know, they'll say things like, "I don't have this, what I need, but I will." make it in some kind of other way. I'll still get to my goal. For example, you know, I was, uh, I was doing a webinar with uh, Lucy Critchen last week, actually. You know, and she was saying, you know, oh, it's really nice, you know, we would have a bonfire and, you know, toast marshmallows and tell stories. You know, and then she said, you know, but sometimes the weather's not great. So we would just make a bonfire, you know, out of kind of colored paper, classroom, and wouldn't have marshmallows, we would have something else, you know. Students can be very imaginative, so you know you just need to be slightly creative, and you can kind of make make stuff up. Um, I think teachers are very good at that. Teachers are very good and very creative. So that's another one. I think uh, teachers need to be caring. I think teachers, good teachers, really mm-hmm. care about them. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just mentioned about engagement, so I think good teachers are engaging. Um, Four. I think that's <laughs> the ability to engage students. Um, and that motivational aspect is really important. So yeah, definitely engagement, I would put. Good teachers are engaging. And it's, it's weird, because I think that people think that being engaging, you know, you need to be entertaining. I think there's a difference between engaging and entertaining. I think mm-hmm. some, te- some teachers think that you need to be like, you know, always kind of up there and always entertaining them. And, and I don't think that's really true. I think you need to be engaging in a, in a particular type of way whether you know you're good at telling them stories or you're good at singing songs or you're good at, you know, to think about the, the content and, you know, not giving them all the answers. These kinds of things I think are key for good teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, three or four, we got four, right? Four and the last one. one we need last one. Last one. I think that good teachers are inspirational. 
that's a good one. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And I, good words. It, I think yeah, I think good <laughs> good teachers good teachers aren't aren't spoon feeding their te- uh, their students. They they're sowing the seeds and then they're sending them out. They're teaching them how to be independent, you know, and then they're they're seeing what students can do by themselves. Mm. And, and and showing them like, you know, this is how great it could be if you did this, you know, if you learn this extra thing. Or, you know, if you get your level one to be two, you know, think of all the extra interactions you'll be able to have when you go on holiday or whatever it is. Inspiring students. I think that's that's a good quality. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much for these five lovely adjectives about the effective language teachers. All right, then. Yeah. So next question. Next question okay. is also a difficult one. If you could if you could have one superpower to use in the classroom, what would it be and how would it help? <laughs> one superpower <laughs> i i would i'm a teacher right so i've got a superpower and i'm a teacher <laughs> yeah 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 sure so uh, i would choose well i mean if i was being smart i would choose time travel um and i would be a history teacher right that would be uh yeah i would be the, I'd, be the, i'd be the best damn history teacher in in hit well ironically in history so yeah time travel see. and history There you go. I'd be able very to just take them. I'd be able to show them. I'd be like, "Come on, taking you guys to fifteen, uh, <laughs> showing you something." Oh yeah, cool. please, but please, but don't take them to in the middle of a war, something like this. Here is the war time, yeah. the whole class. <laughs> <laughs> so that can be just a trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, I take take them to nice. Oh. I see that. Okay, thank you. Time traveler. Okay, it's a nice, nice power, superpower. Thank you. All right. So, Nathan, <clears throat> next question is: What was the the biggest challenge that you faced this year? Biggest challenge in twenty twenty one. Ah, that is a good question. <clears throat> I, th- yeah. I mean, I my team is not here. My team is all in Egypt. So I'm the only person in Dubai, so I guess the biggest challenge is is staying positive and staying connected to to the team that I work with. You know, traditionally I've I've traveled a lot. You know, and, and a lot of things have been face to face. You know, a lot of personal interaction, both with the team that I work with, but also you know teachers as well. You know, and that's kind of been kind of pulled out from under us. So, yeah, I mean, 2021 was kind of like knuckle down get through you know lockdowns probably like severe lockdowns 2021 here in dubai has not been so so harsh not so strict you know it's been quite free this year but on the same time it it feels like we've gone back to normal a little bit here but everything outside of dubai has not kind of kept pace with that so oh, it's yeah it feels <laughs> like you should be able, but you you kind of can't so you know we've kind of pushed everything back to kind of 2022 so I guess yeah, just kind of facing um, isolation, you know, working from home. Um, yeah, it's, it, that's been quite tough. I think it's been quite challenging. I see. I see. All right. So we have a question from our audience. So yeah. Let me look at it. Here is the question: What materials does he use to teach listening skills? Or let's let's say like this: What materials you can can you suggest to use for listening skills, which is more, mm. I think, better. It's- Yeah, I mean it's 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 a ooh, it's a tough question because it depends who who I'm t- who I'm teaching. I guess depends what age mm-hmm. and what level. It's it's a tough one. I I would obviously recommend okay. Macmillan. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. All right then. Okay, so let's skip. But it. it's all right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it's probably. Um, I mean, all all of the course books that we have would be integrated, so it would be teaching listening as as part of of four skills. Yeah, it's, it's, a t- it's, a t- it's a very tough one to answer. Tough. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you can find useful materials in Macmillan books for listening, as you mentioned, it's all integrated. Yeah. So if you get the lots. book, you can get lots of materials to use. All right. Yes. Yeah, if oh, they reach yeah. out to me, thank you. Who and where they teach, then I, I would point them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. So <clears throat> let me move another question. So when you think, you know. The, there are lots of new trends comes up, you know, the, every, for example, every year we, we face different trends about 
teaching or ELT world. So we and also I would like to ask about these trends. So which trend teaching trends actually do you like most? Task based, project based, game based, or etc. Actually, you mentioned a kind of you are a kind of play based. Uh, play based in your philosophy. Yeah, story and story based learning as well. I, but apart from that, I'm a big fan of project based learning (PBL). Um, and I've done quite a lot this year, actually, with teachers on project-based learning. Uh, we've done activities around that um, and webinars as well. A lot of our back-to-school program this year was around project-based learning um, and promoting that, which mm -hmm. is which is nice. I like the fact that um, there's more, this you know, ELT course books are starting to embed really nice projects into uh, the courses that they have. Um, lots of them now have really, really nice projects in there both primary and secondary, and I'm pre-primary as well. Um, so yeah, I love project-based learning. I love, uh, you know, getting students to come up with things, you know, you give them the, the skills and tools. So you give, the, you, know, you give them the language support that they need and you scaffold them through, you know, the project, you know, you model, um, but then you, you kind of let them loose at the end. The nice part of the project is you've kind of done this, this support this scaffolded part and then you kind of see what they can come up with, um, you know, and they can mm -hmm. come up with some amazing things, you know, given, given the chance. So moving away from that, okay, I've taught you this, you know, I've done some language, we've done some reading, and now we're going to do a piece of writing. You know, can they do better than that? You know, can that piece of writing be embedded within a larger project? You know, can, you, can it be collaborative? Can you get students working together, supporting each other? Um, you know, and then, and then they can do it in class they can do it out of class they can like i said before they can bring in digital they could do it paper-based they could make something and and then when they come to present or they come to produce the work that they're that they've produced is more personal to them so it's it's easier for them to use the language they feel they feel a connection to something that they're talking about so if they have to present rather than you know that kind of traditional stand up and, and read you read this paragraph and then the next kid stands up and you read this paragraph and they don't really know what they're reading. You know, they, they've kind of made something, they've put the effort in, they've created a piece mm -hmm. of work. When they come to present it, you, you can see they feel proud of it. You know, they want to talk about it. You know, and if, and if they don't have all the language, you know, they can support each other. You know, do, do you know how to fill in the gap with the vocabulary to help them say what it is they're trying to say? So it's, you know, it's pushing that language further and further all the time, you know, and you're putting the emphasis on them. Um, you're not giving them, giving them, giving them. They have to, they have to find out, they have to find the language to be able to present. They need to find the language to be able to make something. So yeah, I love, I love project-based learning. I think it's really, really nice. Yeah. It's nice. It's really, it's really, I really like also that project-based learning, especially the, the results that the students, you know, that came up at the end of the, the project base. The, the, the productions, the, the part, that's really amazing. They really sometimes make you surprised. For they example, really... the, the, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's why it's really, really useful. Yeah, I really it's like great it for too. parents, especially for the younger children. It's really great for parents to see because they then they start to say, oh, my, like my my child is, is using that language more naturally, more fluently mm -hmm. than just they've learned it at school. They're just kind of reproducing the language. They're actually excited and they, and they use it and they look like they're enjoying it. I think parents kind of appreciate that as well. Yeah, definitely. To see their productions. Yeah. Okay, so my next question is about, again, with the students and the teachers, between students and the teachers. Like, you know, the, what's the, the importance of rapport? And can every teacher achieve it easily in the classroom? Um, I don't, I don't think it comes easily to everybody, um, mm. rapport. It's something that's, I, th I think you, you get better at it the more you practice, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I guess the experience is the easier it is to build rapport with different types of people. So, you know, if, if you're a teacher and you're teaching students that are just like you, well, then you can relate to them. But if they're not <clears> like, <throat> then that can be a lot more difficult, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I guess, it's about being open, I guess. And part of it is about showing students a little bit of yourself. 
So, you know, building that personal relationship and you don't have to be like their best friend, obviously. But I think, you know, you can tell them short stories. It could be about yourself and you could make some of it up. It doesn't all need to be true. They're never going to pull you up and say like, that's not true. I've been stalking you on Instagram. You know, they're not going to say that. They, they just kind of want to feel they know you a little bit um, so that they can trust you. If they trust you, then they're more likely to be interested in your content, you know, and what you're, you're trying to achieve with them. So it's about, yeah, rapport is about trust, uh, respecting students. I think that's quite a difficult thing. I think that, especially with very young children, I think people think that young children should show us respect. You know, I'm the adult, I'm the teacher, you're the child, you know, you should respect me. But actually, I think it does need to be two way. I think that we need to show even little kids, you know, that we respect them, you know, and, and then they're like, okay, well, he respects me. I respect you, trust is built, rapport is built, and then you can kind of get them on your side and motivation and classroom right. engagement. Mm -hmm. Classroom management is easier, right. that kind of thing. Yeah, but it, I don't think it's easy for everybody. But yeah, practice. And again, be open. But, get uh -huh. open. Definitely. But sometimes yeah. I believe that that, you know, the rapport, I think it comes kind of like an intrinsic, you know, it comes from the inside sometimes with you, not always, yeah. you know, the... You cannot learn it sometimes, but something about it in you, you need to have that kind of ability to have this report with the students, a kind of yeah. thing that you have it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what you're saying is you need to be, you need to be the type of person that's interested in people. If you're not the kind of person that's interested in people, then yeah, you become very scientific, I, I guess, in Europe. <laughs> and I, I think teaching and learning is, is an art it's not necessarily a science i think we take it very scientifically you know you look at things mm -hmm. like le lesson plans you know you look at some <coughs> lesson plans Sorry. every single second counted for you know warm up 90 seconds uh listening activity three minutes it's so scientific and you know you're asking me about philosophies i think you know with older students i re really used to like uh do like dogma you know just having a goal yeah. and, and see students uh -huh. take you you know you get some weird and wonderful lessons that way and you know you have, you have your goal that you want to get them to produce a paragraph or something or focus on some grammar but you know what they what they make up throughout the lesson and then they get engaged they get really into it you know and then back in the next lesson and they're like i went home and i kind of i thought about it again and i really <laughs> check it and you're like oh, okay great that's that's fantastic so and again that's important I see. I got it. There's a. We have a question here. Let me show you. Here is the question. What would he suggest to deal with the stu students with misbehaviors in the classroom? Ooh, it's you know it's I, it's <laughs> it's get the root of of what we would call a misbehavior. I think a lot of students. I mean, again, it depends on the age. If this is an adult who is misbehaving, then. Obviously, you're going to interact with them differently than you are a primary school student. But I think, again, we, what we were just saying then about uh, rapport and, and classroom management, they go hand in hand. So, you know, a lot of students, certainly in my experience, that you think are misbehaving, it's, it's usually a cover for something else. It could be something that's going on outside of school, you know, and you've got to kind of get to the root of that. Uh, there might be problems at home. There might be problems between them and other students. So you think that they're kind of just class, but actually, usually there's a reason behind it. In fact, that usually it's for me, it's it's the, the student that you really need to worry about are the ones that are not misbehaving. The ones that are kind of quiet, um, they're the ones that usually have real problems. Um, mm -hmm. So I think to getting get them to open up and express themselves. Find out, but the students that are misbehaving, it's usually you know it's a front for, um, you know, they're either kind of acting up to kind of hide something, or there's something going on, you know, that you need to find the root of. I think. And again, building is usually a good way to to try and fish that out. And sometimes you mm -hmm. let you find it out. I mean, I taught in Vietnam, and I remember there there was uh, I had a teaching assistant actually, and there was one of the students, and he was just sitting under the table. Um, under the and table. He, he was sitting sitting under the table and of course you know they were they were quite strict and she was saying he's not allowed to sit under the table and i said just you know ignore him he, leave him for a bit you know he was sitting under the table so you know we we got all the other kids into their activity 
you know, got them doing their work. They were in little groups. And he was still under there. He was under there for like most of the lesson, you know, and then eventually I just said, you know, ignore him, just leave him under there, get the kids doing, get them on the topic, get them on task. They're all working away happily, you know, and then I just went and sat under the table with him for like five minutes, you know, and just was just like, you know, are you okay? Do you want to work under the table? I'll bring it here and you can do it here under the table. If that's, you know, where you feel comfortable, you know, and eventually he kind of opened up a little bit and, you know, he did come out from under the table and, you know, it was just, I don't know, he, he had a problem and he didn't know how to express it. You know, oh, you've got to think of, you've got to be, you know, rather than just being like, you must come out, you must sit at your desk. I've got work for you to do, you know, try and relate to them a little bit. And, um, you know, they, they do come around, you know, and then eventually, you know, a month later, he's one of the best students, you know, he's sitting there, he's doing his work. Wow. You have to get to know them. So, yeah, it's... That, that kind of stuff not not I not see. jumping in straight away and, uh -huh. and being like i'm i must make the rules sometimes you got to ease them in and i, I can't mm. remember there was a, there was a, but i can't remember what it is now definitely the like english says that uh love the approach yeah and yeah, nilgun, uh, nilgun says to be able to make the students achieve the objectives we need lesson plans i think and however Experienced teachers may skip making the plans as, uh, sorry, as they tend to feel what's going well or wrong. Mm. I think, I think that's, I think that's true. I think very experienced teachers either don't write down their lesson plans anymore or they're very short, you know, they've got a kind of main goal and then they think, okay, right. I want to achieve this by the end of the lesson. And then they, I want three different routes to get there and you know and i'm gonna figure out which students can can and which can which ones cannot and then i will accordingly give them tasks to get to that goal so they they will mm -hmm. yeah they'll have a goal and then they will an, uh, an objective uh, they will have that clear in their mind and then they will think of different pathways for different students to achieve that <coughs> that i see very effective mm -hmm. yeah very And also, she, she she said another thing, like, on the other hand, I still believe that teachers need to be flexible and autonomous, even if they have lesson plans. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would totally agree with that. Yeah, your lesson plan is a guide. Mm -hmm. Your objectives are most important. Your lesson plan want to pull those objectives off. But yeah, be, be flexible. Um, and I think realizing that students probably aren't learning what we think they're learning at the time that we think they're learning it. You know, students need you know, repetitive uh, reinforcement continuously of probably over multiple lessons and probably in multiple ways as well. So, uh, you know, realizing that it, they're not going to just learn that grammar point in the five minutes presented to them, they've got to keep coming back to it. And again, this is where things like projects, stories, it keeps, they keep seeing that language, they're exposed to it over and over again, you know, and eventually then they start to go, okay, now I, it's starting to make sense. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in a story seen it in a piece of formal writing i've heard it spoken i've seen it in a video okay now i feel confident to use that grammar point um yeah yeah so uh, yeah i totally agree totally agree you totally agree okay thank you very much uh Nilgin, for the uh, comment all right so let's move to by the way we just have a couple uh, two questions and also we are almost right you know the time flies we're almost coming end of our session Really, okay. and uh, <laughs> it's really time flies. All right, so um, yeah. let me ask you the next question. So when yeah. you when you think about the five W's and how, like who, what, where, when, why, and how, what questions come to your mind about ELT world? I can count again, like who, what, where, who? when, why, and who? how. Who, what, where, when, why, why? How? okay. How, yeah. What questions um, come to your mind? First one was who. So who, I mean, I guess the most natural question is like, who, who am I teaching? Do I really know them? I guess that's a kind of natural question. But actually, I think, <clears throat> for who, I, think I think a really good question to ask yourself when you're teaching is who is benefiting from what we're doing and who isn't? And again, we've done the work on um, inclusivity over the last year. Um, so and, and that's part of that. So I guess the, the who and the, the what go together. So like who, who is benefiting from this approach, you know, whether it's project or whether it's input or whether it's stories, you know, 
not everybody is always going to benefit from everything that you're doing. So, you know, asking yourself who, who's not really benefiting. And again, that's reflection. So you might sit there and reflect and say, okay, you know, these, this group of students is not really benefiting from this particular approach. And what can I do to change that? Yeah. What can I give them to make them be able to access the content in the same way that their peers? I, see. I think that's yeah. really, then I think, uh, what we got next? Well, where and when we'll put them together as well, because I think they do go quite well together. Yeah, so sure. this is about being critical to, to, to learning itself. So where and when should students learn? Does it need to be between eight and three? And does it need to be in a classroom? So that's the kind of where and the when. I think people are starting to realize that students, you know, have their own ways of learning. They like to learn in places. They like to learn at certain times of the day. And again, that's becoming very inclusive as well. So, you know, okay, maybe during class, not the best time for that particular student to learn this particular thing. So, you know, can I give them something so that they can access it at, at home in their own time? Um, you know, again, that's, I see. that's right. Uh -huh. So yeah, challenging yourself about the where and the when of when learning should take place, being quite critical to that. Uh -huh. And then why, that's, that's a tough one. How I'm not <laughs> <laughs> running out of things to think about, probably covering them all. How, I'm trying to think of a good how, 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 how. I don't know. My mind's gone blank. All there right. No problem. That's all. It's okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, uh, Nathan. Probably uh, in your in your in your teaching career and, and like trainer career, you have read lots of lots of books and maybe other other things about the ELT mm. world. So, what can you suggest us to read about ELT? Just a couple of things. Can you suggest? Yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's so much material now, and, and the nice thing about the internet is you can access a lot of it for free now. So, you know, I would say, you know, obviously start with Macmillan. We've got lots of stuff to read. You know, and if you go to Macmillan, again, macmillanenglish.com, uh, there's lots of things like blogs on there. So, you know, some really good blog writers, you know, people like Anna Hasper, uh, Jay Blue. There's really good, there's some blogs um, on the website. You know, and I would say read teachers' blogs as well. You know, read about people who have the same kinds of challenges that you do. It's all very well to be, you know, to read books. You know, oh, I could pick up and read a, you know, a huge book about reflective practice. I can pick up a huge book about project-based learning. But actually, I think a lot of, I think what teachers really like, they like content that they can relate to. And I think teachers' blogs are really nice. I read lots of teachers' blogs, and they give me great ideas, you know, and uh -huh. that's for training. Or teachers reading it also they read it and think this is great you know i'll try this teachers blogs are often very practical as well they often say like you know i tried this i tried this students this you can you maybe expect this you know so i i would say read teachers blogs mingle in english one stop english has got loads of great stuff on there to read yeah. lots mm -hmm. of blogs one stop english all the time um for a book uh if, you, if i've been talking about story-based approach so there's a book by Jeremy Harmer and Herbert Gupta, which is uh, story-based language teaching. That's a really nice book. I read that last year. We did a project around that. So I would wow. recommend that. If you want to get into, you know, how to really use stories in the classroom, uh, you know, really, really draw out the kind of pre-reading, during reading and post-reading activities, um, you know, and in, a, in a language, not just kind of stories in a literature in a literacy literature based focus because people want mm -hmm. if they're if engaging with stories they want students language to be in, improving right so it, it, it really helps right. to kind of map that out it's really nice so it, it's interesting actually because i think that i mean from experience i think teachers go okay pre-reading i can do that that's kind of you know giving them the vocabulary so they know what to expect and post-reading activities i think they're with they're kind of like okay we finished the reading and i'll give them a, a task to do. actually uh -huh. i think teachers really struggle with the during reading activities i and it, it's it's a tough one i think that mo i think if you pitch it to most teachers like what is a during reading activity i think a lot of them would struggle to come up with a, a really good answer Quite, uh, uh, read that, you will learn the answer to that question you're right it's very good tips yeah dr tamar delit says great tips about it <laughs> she said thank you 
Thank you, thank you, Nathan, about about these suggestions. And by the way, if, if, is it possible after the session, can you just uh, text me or send an email about the books that you mentioned so I can share them yep. with, yeah, with my uh, the Creative English Instagram page. All right, thank yeah. you. And here is the last question. Ready for it? Yes. Okay. What is your motto? My motto. Yeah, your motto. Uh, so I don't know if I have a motto. To be honest, I really like. Uh, <laughs> I really like a particular quote, and I and I heard a quote, this quote, years back, probably before I even got into education. I'd say it's one of my favorite. Uh, you've probably heard it. It's by an Irish playwright called George Bernard Shaw. So uh -huh. actually, if people are in the probably might know it. The quote is: uh, "We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing." And then, uh, I think that's a really. Yeah, I heard it. You I probably have it. a lot of people. Really? Yeah, I heard it. Yeah, this, this idea that, you know, we kind of get beaten down as an adult, um, you know, retain that imaginative, playful childhood nature and, um, yeah, don't get too stressed about things. That would probably, that would be, probably, don't worry so much. Yeah. <laughs> but that's we, a wonderful quote. We get, we get very stressed, but, uh, you know, in, in the big picture, you know, if you think about what you were really stressed about, let's say, two years ago, how stressed are you about it now? Probably not that stressed. It's yeah. fizz fizzles away into the history. So don't get too stressed. Retain your childhood uh, persona. Be imaginative. Be playful. Uh, and keep learning. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's, we, we, we concluded. It's a great quote. Thank you very much, Nathan. All right, then. So that's all from Teacher Talks. And about, about by my side, the questions, that's all. And before ending our live, live sessions, would you like to add anything else, Nathan? Uh, I, I don't think so. I've talked a lot. So uh, I think <laughs> I've probably covered me and everything about me and teaching in the past hour. So thank you very much for, for having me. It's been a real pleasure to, uh, to, to come on and, and chat. And it's, yeah, it's been great. And thanks for the questions. They weren't... They weren't too challenging. They were okay. <laughs> okay, it's great to hear that. And and I would like to say one more time, thank you very much, Nathan. Really, it was a fruitful session. It was a lovely session. It's really great honor to have you in Teacher Talks 80. So we had really, uh, we had really uh, ex excellent times here and really great times. And I'm sure that the people also really like it. And we got you know, nice things from you, learn from you, from your suggestions. And also the most important thing, you spend your time with us, which is precious. Thank you very much, Nathan. And that's all uh, from Teacher Talks, everybody. And for tonight, and Nathan Waller was with us uh, from Macmillan Education. And I hope you enjoyed the session like me. And we will see each other next Monday. At the same time, on the same day, as usual, you know, the teacher talks time and same, never change on the same day at the same time. And until next time, take care of yourselves and peace, everybody. And bye-bye. Bye-bye, Nathan. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Falcon. Take care. Bye.